So welcome to lecture 25 in our series on prosody. In this lecture, we'll be talking about dialogue systems and how prosody can work within them and make them better. Uh, a lot of this will be discussion about future applications because most current systems really don't leverage prosody very much. So if you think about uh, many of the dialogue systems you currently use, that might be an online packing application or something like Siri or Alexa, these systems can be really impressive, but they are in many ways limited. So you might feel a bit like you're talking at the system and it is talking at you rather than there being a natural, fluent, um, interactive conversation the way you might have with another person. And we hope that future systems will be able to allow us to engage more interactively. And many of the limitations on these systems have to do with their inability to take advantage of prosodic things. So current systems are focused on now a fairly limited number of tasks and genres. So things like answering questions, obeying commands, um, maybe reading things such as bedtime stories or other content or giving diving directions. But future applications might allow for richer applications and interactions around things like small talk or counseling or even tutoring and other sorts of assistive technologies. So when we introduce dialogue systems and their potential um, use of prosody in lecture two, we guided you in as seeing this being a way of allowing the user to interact with content in the digital world. And that's good for certain types of limited interactions, but for inter interactions, we really do rely on human capabilities to do many of these tasks. And in perhaps a bit of a cliched way of putting it, robots need not apply. So what do these richer interactions rely on? So they rely on a number of key capabilities that are sort of inextricably intertwined with things like prosody or expressed through prosody. So you want a person who's answering a user's call to be sensitive. So they need to be able to determine quickly, often based on the speaker's prosody, whether they're upset or happy, concerned, nervous, and they need to take that into account when they speak, they need to be empathetic and tailor their responses to the user's state. And they need to be able to express, for example, concern or sympathy effectively. And that's typically done through prosodic means. And importantly, they need to be adaptive. Not all the users are going to have the same attitudes when they call in and the respondent needs to be able to adjust the way they're speaking to suit the right sorts of reactions for the user. So if we consider the structure of a dialogue system, not just sort of these high level interactional behaviors, so how do these systems work? So this is a typical uh, sketch of a dialogue systems architecture, where on the left hand side we have the user, uh, they say something, it comes in through speech recognition to extract the word content that's passed downstream to a semantic decoder to get out what it is that the user means that's passed to a dialogue system, dialogue management component, which figures out how to respond to that content, uh, maybe looking up content on the web, and then that in turn generates language to be spoken back to the user that's passed through the synthesizer to produce that waveform. So there are many ways that prosody can be employed in the context of these dialogue systems. Um, if we look back to the speech synthesis lecture, we saw that prosody can be used to reinforce a message. So articulate in a way that makes the actual content clearer. It can also be used to convey pragmatic intents or um, express particular personalities or maybe the brand of the system in question. We also saw that prosody can have some role, but usually not a very large one in speech recognition. It can have perhaps a larger role in certain types of structural disambiguation that arise in extracting the meaning from what the user has said. In contrast, a larger role comes from managing the interaction, managing turn taking and turn shaping. So certain things like 
back channels, which we looked at also at in a previous lecture, involve or are cued by the way the user is speaking. So the right place to have an adaptive or an attitudinal token like uh-huh is typically triggered by prosodic characteristics of the user's speech. In addition, things like telling when a speaker is done speaking or whether they have more to say, so turn taking, is also typically cued through prosodic means. And there are some systems that actually take advantage of that now to be able to figure out when a speaker is done talking. In addition to all that, the dialogue management system, the types of response given based on the user's state, goals, and intentions, can also be enriched by using prosodic information. So a good example of this from work by Forbes Riley and Littman on developing a spoken language physics tutor set the situation up such that when the user gave a response, if the answer was correct, the system would praise them and move on. If they gave an incorrect response to a question, the system would explain and ask again. But crucially, the system would also consider the case that the user was, or the student, was correct, but exhibited low confidence in producing their response. So something like, the keys would fall forward and down? And in that sort of case where the student is expressing uncertainty, the system would have a different response than just based on the correctness of their utterance alone, use the prosodic cues to uncertainty, and that would trigger an explain and ask again response. And importantly, this additional use of uh, student confidence information actually led to improved learning. So leveraging prosody to do this can actually give better tutoring outcomes. Now, if we continue with dialogue management, in addition to sort of recognizing user states, the dialogue manager itself can inform the way the speech is synthesized to make um, more appropriate responses or express responses which are more aware of the user's state. So again, in a tutoring session, you could have a tutoring system that was such as the one developed by Ward and Escalante Ruiz, where the system, when the user did something correctly, would say good job, but would tailor the pronunciation and the prosody, importantly, based on different aspects of the tutoring setting, as here. Good job, good job, good job. Good job, good job. And a few more examples. Good job. Good job. So these different prosodic realizations of good job were conditioned on things like the situation, whether they were answering a hard question, um, whether the user seemed to be confident or needed more time, or whether the system was in a different state where they wanted the user to speed up or delay or not give up. So all of these different aspects allow the system to tailor its feedback prosodically to the student and to the students and the system and the interaction state. So we've seen that there are many, many ways in which prosody can inform and improve and enhance the dialogue system's experience. However, success in this area is quite challenging. So there are a couple of reasons for this. So why don't we see more of it since it seems so natural and so useful? One important factor is that scaling up is hard. These two dialogue systems and tutoring examples we saw were great, very effective, but they were the result of multiple person years of effort to carefully engineer a particular design for one specific application. And that's more investment than most dialogue systems developers are going to put in. And it's not entirely clear at this point that we can learn this sort of interaction information from data. Maybe it's possible, but we don't know how to do it yet. In addition, it's hard to do prosody right. Um, dialogue systems make mistakes all the time, so 
you might ask a system for the weather in Austin and have the system say the weather in Boston is. And most users will say, oh, that's an understandable error. Um, I'll just articulate a little more clearly and get the right thing. But with prosody, saying something in a tone that is perceived differently from its intended sound, maybe something that sounded sarcastic or um, insulting, or if you say rainy, is not going to be okay, and it could be really, really detrimental to the interaction. So we need to be sensitive to the fact that people can have very quick and very subtle responses to differences in prosody that can be manipulated. Um, an early system I worked on, uh, the users reported that the way it said hello sounded sleazy. This was not something we programmed in. It was an effect of the way people perceive and perceive differently the prosody of speech. So we believe that there's a lot of work going on in prosody and that many of these problems are potentially resolvable and we could succeed in them. However, there are potentially some possibly scary outcomes. We already have dialogue systems or speech recognition systems that can transcribe what people are saying even more accurately than humans do. So there is the potential for building systems that have similarly sort of superhuman prosodic abilities, and these could have negative economic or societal outcomes. So perhaps they could replace those call center workers and take their jobs or um, enable scams where, say, those spamming phone call people trying to sell you things actually sound like someone that you know or sound more convincing. And these sorts of interactions could increase human alienation as we interact more with these high quality systems than perhaps with ordinary people. Now, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't study prosody, but that we should be careful and thoughtful about the applications as the systems improve. So that brings us to the end of our lecture on dialogue systems and this module on the application of prosody in technology and applications. In the next lectures, um, we'll zoom out and take a wider view of prosody and we'll begin by looking at individual differences.